the songs that we sang this morning came straight out of Scripture. Uh, and not just any Scripture, but Old Testament prophetic Scripture. Sometimes through the lens of, uh, of things that were said by Paul. And yeah, kids can go off to Sunday school. Of course you can. Don't feel obligated to sit here and listen to me ramble. I'm sure if some of the adults were able to go up to them, but we sang these songs of uh, looking forward, uh, these songs uh, that claimed these promises that uh, were made to God's people millennia ago. They're exciting, and, and they spoke to my heart, and again, I, I found comfort. This morning, I, I came into into this uh, into this sanctuary this morning feeling pretty rough, to be honest. And if if I was if I was another preacher, if I was another pastor, I mean, there's probably twenty pastors across North America at least that walked in with a cold and stood up and said to their congregations, you know, Satan's trying to stop me from preaching this word to you this morning. That's not where my head goes, but I have a head cold. And I came in, and we sang. And I got a chance to reconnect with the truth of who God is and, and, and the good that he has for us. And a lot of that fell away. Not necessarily the feeling physically, but how important that all is in the big picture. We've been talking about big picture stuff, uh, the past few weeks, uh, we set aside a month to deal with questions, questions that have been asked to me that I can't deal with in, you know, two minutes or five minutes. And we talked about, uh, you know, why are there so many churches, so many different churches? What's different about them? Which one's right? And, and we talked about kind of that, the core stuff that is Christianity, and then these kind of outside rings where how, we, uh, how we've decided to interpret certain passages of the Bible or the, the lens that we've brought to Scripture have almost made this like choose your own adventure book that uh, we seem to have a difference you know, down here at the bottom. But really it's because there was something farther up that we had a different perspective of and that changed the way we approached a variety of different things. But ultimately, when we work our way back up that chain of, of choices, chain of interpretations, we arrive at a core of Christianity that we are united around. There are different churches because we have different thoughts, different experiences that we bring to the table, and God's okay with that because I think God's bigger than any of our one set of experiences. We talked about why are there all these different Bibles? We weren't here for that, but if, if you were online for our uh, snow day service, we talked about how like, there are different ways of, of interpreting spheres of meaning. There's nuances. And once again, that chain of events, chain of choices, changes how things get translated or uh, how things get approached. And that's okay, too. I said the best Bible, the one that's right, is the one that you'll pick up and read, because the core truths of Christianity are going to be the same, no matter where you go. You might find a couple different expressions. That's okay. Last week, we came to the table for less of a head thing and more of a, I'm not even going to say hard thing, a gut thing, talking about why is it so hard? If, if God loves us and God has saved us and God is powerful, it's, it's, we're not just talking about like, if God is all powerful, why is there evil and suffering in the world? But if God loves us and has saved us, why is it hard to live a Christian life? Why is it hard to go about being his people on earth? Wouldn't he get more credit by making things easier for us? Wouldn't he, wouldn't he, shouldn't he, shouldn't he? And the answer was, I don't know. I don't know why it's so hard. 
but having a head answer for why it's so hard, a good quality answer that it's, oh yes, sure, I can accept that, is less likely and less useful to me than knowing that he's with us in it. And through Jesus Christ has experienced the depths of suffering and knows what it's like for the world to be an absolute mess and our lives to be an absolute mess. And he is okay with us calling out to him and saying, I don't want this. He's okay for us to, to be reaching out to him and saying, God, this is a mess and I'm having doubts and I'm having troubles. And he will just crawl into it with us and say, that's okay. Because more than I want a God who gives me answers, I need a God who gives me strength and who, who walks with me through the mess and says, it's, it's okay. Those are some, some big questions. And they're, they're questions that aren't apologetics questions. They're not like uh, prove God is real kind of questions or justify the gospel kind of questions. They're questions that hit at the heart of people who go to church, who have made a decision to follow Jesus Christ and yet still feel like it's messy. Today's question actually did come from someone in our congregation, and I know it's a question that is held by people that are in our congregation. Uh, that person isn't here today, but uh, maybe they'll check this out online, maybe they won't. This is also a question, I, I, I waffle back and forth between two questions I've gotten. Both of them were likely to get me in trouble, so I chose this one. Um, have you guys seen the news lately? Any news, really. Um, people get really excited when they see stuff happen in the Middle East. Uh, Israel has been in the news a lot. And whether that's in, in connection with UN stuff, whether that's in connection with uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, whether it's in connection with Iran. Iran has been huge in the news with the conflicts with the U.S. A couple years ago, uh, the U.S. announced that they were moving their embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And that was a huge deal to a lot of people. It was uh, seen as a, a strong affirmation of, of Israel, a statement, uh, taking sides. Some people were really yay about it, some people less so. You know, a couple years before that, a uh, guy wrote a book called Four Blood Moons that took, uh, took a segment of the, the Christian church by storm, saying because there were four full moons that were also close to the earth at, uh, or sorry, four lunar eclipses that were also at times that the, the moon was close to the earth, so it appeared larger in the sky, that something really huge was going to happen in Israel because that's how God works. Look, sorry, I need to take a second to pray. Uh, God, I need your help this morning to be gracious. I need your help to, to be kind to my brothers and sisters in Christ who we agree with on the stuff that matters. I don't want to be the guy that that gets snarky and does hot takes, so please give me grace. Thank you. Amen. Okay, uh, moving on. There, the question is, what's the big deal with Israel? Okay, what does Israel have to do with anything? It is one way to phrase it. Uh, what I heard, the direct quote for the question that came to me, was, "Why don't you talk more about Israel?" Some people say, well, do Christians have to support Israel? Is that, is that in our job description as Christians, we, we have to support Israel? What does Israel have to do with anything? Well, our understanding of Israel is a pretty big branch in, in the tree of kind of choices of understandings that uh, branch out how we understand Scripture. It can have a big impact on how we approach faith and life, you know, whether we think about it or not. If we've read the Bible, if we've, uh, if we've engaged prophecy, 
if we've engaged what God has for us, if we have sung songs that touch on things that are in the Old Testament, things that are forward-looking, we're engaging with the topic of what about Israel? And for some people, it, it seems like they've got one idea when they're singing, and one idea when they're reading, and one idea when they're watching the news. Because some of the things that we sing about, some of the things that we talk about, well, they don't line up with other choices that were made on our, on our little pyramid that I drew there. Some people don't think about this. Uh, some people think about it way too much, if I'm, if I'm really honest, in my opinion. This is one of those things that Christians can and do disagree about. It's, it's very much on the outside ring of the circle. So we try and treat each other with respect on this. But in the evangelical church, um, the, the Wesleyan Church is a member of the Evangelical Churches of Canada, and uh, we, uh, we talk about evangelical churches as being uh, believing in the inerrancy of Scripture, uh, believing in the need for a personal decision to follow Christ for salvation, and believing in our mission to share the gospel of Christ with the world. That's kind of the, the three legs of the stool that uh, you'd set the evangelical label on. It, it has come to mean a lot more other things politically right now that I'm not entirely comfortable with, but the evangelical church has placed a huge emphasis on the nation of Israel. Reasons Christians support Israel. There's three major reasons. End times prophecy. So the things that they have read in the Bible that say Israel will something. And we want to see Jesus come back. And we want to look to see whatever chain of events is, is being laid out in here happen. And Israel seems to be very prominent in that. So... Israel gets the nod for the sake of end times prophecy. The second reason is a promise to Abraham. See, when we go back right into to Genesis, this is early stuff, this is Sunday school stuff, God, God's talking to, to Abraham and he calls him and says, come out of the nation you're in. I'm going to take you to a promised land. Your descendants will number like the stars in the heavens. And this is going to be given to you for all time. So they say this land belongs to Abraham's children, it belongs to Israel, and it is only right to support that, because God said so, and we are the enforcers of our Lord God Most High. Sorry. And the third reason is politics. Uh, evangelical Christians tend to be uh, people that believe in democracy and, and capitalism and all those things just because of history. And in that region, Israel is the only de democracy that's around. It's surrounded by uh, Muslim nations that are, are basically run uh, by the religious leaders. Uh, they call it a theocracy. And we're not entirely comfortable with having a whole bunch of nations that are being run in the name of Islam. That's the three reasons. End times prophecy, that this land has been promised to the descendants of Abraham, and politics. Two of those are legitimate reasons, in my opinion, to support Israel as a nation. One of them is self-serving and questionable as far as a religious motivation. You're not going to find democracy in the Bible. You're not going to find capitalism in the Bible. And I'm going to move on very quickly from that. We sang today. No. We sang today from Ezekiel, believe it or not. We sang from Ezekiel. We sang from chapter 
37, and this is a story I've read before. It's a story that I've, I've, I've read and, and we've sung multiple songs that touch on this. And it, it's talking about a, a vision that God gave to Ezekiel, this tr- valley of dry bones. This valley of dry bones was, was God's people. This valley of dry bones was Israel. Can these bones live again? He says. And he starts prophesying, and the bones come together, and, and the they, they, they're there, but they have no life in them. And then he prophesies again, and the breath of God comes into them, and they come back to life. These dry bones live. And he goes through, and there's some other prophecies he gives talking about uh, the union of, of Israel and the lost tribes. It goes on to say, they'll never again pollute themselves with idols, vile images of rebellion. I'll save them from their sinful backsliding. I'll cleanse them. They will truly be my people, and I will be their God. My servant David will be their king, and they will have only one shepherd. And it goes on and on. And then we have something in 38 about... Uh, the land of Gog and face Gog of the land of Magog, prince who rules over the nations of Meshech and Tubal and prophesy against him, and goes on the slaughter of Gog's horde, Gog's hordes. And this is all the promise of the restoration of God's people, and it's weird. Have you ever had someone use the same word to mean two different things, or at least they're using a word, and you don't think it means what they think it means? I'm struggling to think of a good example that everyone would get, and all I'm coming up with is being in like grade six or seven and giggling because in the theme song to Flintstones, it talked about having a yabba dabba do time and have a gay old time. And, and we would snicker because it said gay. Ha ha ha. Very different meaning, same word. But imagine somebody came to you and, and said that the Flintstones was obviously pushing a homosexual agenda because it says they have a gay old time. I think most people would feel like I think you're reaching for that. You're stretching. It's it's, it's not what's going on here. I think I'm going to explain this in a bit. That's a lot of the problem that we have. When we talk about why is Israel so important? What's the big deal with Israel? Should Christians support Israel, I would say absolutely Christians have to support Israel. They must support Israel. But I don't think the word that you're using means what you think it means. I know I've talked uh, before, I've told a story about sitting in my grandparents' uh, living room in the 80s, uh, watching uh, This Week in Bible Prophecy. It was uh, you know, a show, I think it came right after 700 Club. And it was explaining how events in the Middle East right now, these oil wars, were direct fulfillment of things, prophecies like that prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 38. And, uh, you know, actually a few weeks ago, I was just looking this up on YouTube, January 7th, you can go back and watch it if you want to find out why I'm wrong and they're right. Uh, just look up Calvary Chapel. Why is Iran so important? A few weeks ago, they did this, this big show about breaking down the end times. What role Iran and Russia are going to play in the end times. and How the Bible predicts how they're going to attack America and Israel. Which is amazing because America wasn't around 1700 years after the Bible was written. But if that's the lens that you're bringing to the table, and that's what that looks like, then it's important for you to know this. It's vital for you to understand And they'll say, isn't it amazing that God gave this vision to Ezekiel 2,600 years ago before any of these countries ever existed? And clearly that uh, in Gog and Magog is is Persia, and uh, Meshech means Moscow. And people sit there and go, 
This is amazing. It affects our lives. It affects how we approach politics. It affects how we approach the, the relationships that our countries have with the rest of the world. Jehovah's Witnesses have, uh, have read the, the Bible cover to cover, probably more than I have a lot of the time. And they'll look at the book of Revelation, and they'll see this passage that says, John looked up and saw 144,000 elders, you know, 12,000 from each tribe. And they said, clearly that means that the end of the world will come when we have 144,000 members. This refers to Jehovah's Witnesses. 144,000 is our goal. We're going to go proselytize, get more witnesses, and then Jesus will come back. And they hit 144,000, and Jesus didn't come back. So they had to go back and find it, redo the math. What did I do wrong? Did I misinterpret? Okay, well, no, it means 144,000 of this class of members of Jehovah's Witnesses, and in our little pyramid scheme, you need to sell this many things in order to get to this class of Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm not even lying. We dig into these prophecies. We dig into these prophecies. And it's almost like a game of prophetic Mad Libs. Like, you know Mad Libs? You, get, look at, like, you fill in, like, okay, I need a noun. I need an action word. I, I need a thing that is orange. And then you go through and you, you read it all out. And it's, it's awfully funny. But it feels like we, we read through and, and we go, okay, so we're going to put the name of the dictator here and, and the name of the Middle Eastern country here. And, and then we're going to have, you know, oh, a natural disaster here and something in space like moons or planets or stars up here. And, and we go, okay, well, here we can put Y2K, yeah, the year 2000. And, and oh, here we got the invention of the UPC code, which is clearly the mark of the beast. That was a thing. Some of you may remember it, some of you may not. A large subset of the church, you know, the, bar the barcodes, the things that are on all the products, you scan them, it identifies them, runs through a computer. The mark of the beast, we are in the end times of Revelation. And then nothing happens. And then more nothing happens. Well, clearly, we, we got that wrong, but we were close, and we keep reinterpreting and reinterpreting. The same guys that were doing This Week in Bible Prophecy then, then have a YouTube show now, and they're hitting the same passages and, and ignoring, like they don't want to say, oh, we were wrong about it then. It, it's actually this dictator and this natural disaster and this celestial event. I said, why? Why? You ever heard the phrase, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail? They got these prophecies, and they want it to be end times now. We dig into prophecy for insights. We dig into prophecy for insight into the future, usually because we lack a sense of security. We lack a feeling that it is okay now. And we need to know that it's going to be okay then, and not just then, but soon. We lack a sense of control in our world and in our lives. And we don't just want to know God is in control, we want to know the plan. We want to know the details. We want to know the timeline. I went to a church when I was in Bible college once. I went there once. Because I walked in and looked. And across the wall, behind where someone would stand up and talk, across the wall, wall to wall, there was a chart of the end times. The timeline, this is going to happen, and this is going to happen, and then this many weeks pass, and this is going to And I'm just like, I don't know how long ago that was, and I don't know if they revised their timeline or if they left it loose enough that it could sit there for a while without needing to be repainted. But this was the focus of the church. They wanted to know the plan. They wanted to know the dates. They wanted to have all the I's dotted and the T's crossed so they could be ready. I wish we had all been ready this all went. 
these days are the last days of the late great planet Earth, written in the 70s, look in the Y2K. Tim, Tim LaHaye's Left Behind series that explains what it's going to be like in the rapture. Prophetic Mad Libs. When you have a hammer, it's a big hammer, it's a good hammer, everything looks like a nail. So I said, what about these words that, that seem to sound like the same thing, but they're maybe mean different things? We've got this land now. We've got this area. You look at the news, and there's this big map of the Middle East. Right there is this little country on the bank of the Jordan where Jesus walked, the birthplace of our Lord and Savior. It's called Israel. If you look at a map about uh, 70 years ago, it's not there. There's, there's been conflict through that region. I'm not, I could dig into history. I, I'm not going there. I'm not going to bore you with that chunk. We can talk about it if, if you want, if this is something you want to dig into, but not here. But over the past 70 years or so, the support for that, that little piece of land that is called Israel on the map has grown in the evangelical church. It did not start high. But more and more, we've dug in on this. They took this land, these people, and they made a country there, and they called it Israel. So the question is, is it? It took a long time to get to that question. But that is the core of dealing with this issue. Should Christians support Israel? Do Christians have to support Israel? Why don't you talk more about Israel, Pastor Aaron? What's the big deal with Israel? What does Israel have to do with anything? When, when we talk about this in, in theology circles, uh, in, in, in you know, going deeper and and past this, you, you have kind of a couple of camps. You have a camp that says Israel, God's people, is, and, and I'll, I'll walk through this on the slides, Robert. Uh, God's people are the Jews, right? The Jews are the, the, the descendants of Abraham, uh, Isaac and Jacob, and you know, God gave the promise to them. The promise was this land. The promise was forever, and God sustained them through all this time, and they are still God's chosen people, and we need to support them. And you have another camp that says, no, at, at the time that Christ came, Israel stopped being the Jewish people, and there's a new spiritual Israel, and that is the church. They call that replacement theology, that up to this point, God's chosen people are the Jewish people, boom, cut it off, over here, is the new God's chosen people. I think that both of those are defensible from Scripture. Okay. Bring it back here, because we're not there yet. Both of those are defensible from Scripture, but both of those miss some key points. Both of those will reach back into the, the book of Romans, and this is where you'll see everybody going when they're talking about this. They'll, they'll be in Romans uh, chapter 9 to 11, and in chapter 11, it'll talk, it talks about uh, God uh, loving Israel and wanting them to come to him still, and that uh, the people of Israel are not cut off. And so that seems fairly obvious. And they take that verse and they, they wrap it back all through everything else. Or you'll find somewhere in Hebrews that it says that uh, there's a spiritual Israel. Or you'll hear Jesus talking. We just did this whole year on the Sermon on the Mount that says, don't think that you, because you have Abraham as your father, that earns you anything. 
God can raise up children of Abraham from the rocks. It can be a bit messy. I was going to walk, walk through all this uh, straight out of, of Romans, and this is in Romans, and I will explain it directly to you at a later date if you want to, but I don't want to take a huge ton of time with this. But here's the history of God's people, Israel. There's a promise to Abraham, and it begins, right? There's God's chosen people. He makes a promise to Abraham, that promise is forever. It's sealed in a covenant. And God doesn't break his promises. And so there's this, this picture that God's chosen people, Israel, is Abraham, and it keeps going, and it's all the way, and right now it's not all the way to this arrow pointing to this little country in the Middle East called Israel. But along the way, we see this. We see Abraham at the beginning. And then there's stories about Isaac. We like Isaac, we take him up the mountain. But there's also Ishmael. Ishmael was uh, the, the son, of, uh, son of Hagar, who was basically Abraham's slave, who got given to him when he didn't have enough faith to wait for Sarah to have a baby, and they got sent off because the promise was for Isaac. So now we have God's chosen people, Israel, the descendants of Abraham, but not those descendants of Abraham. But it carries on. And, and we have the story of uh, Isaac and Jacob, right? The, the twins who were, who were back and forth, one's hairy, one likes to cook, and, and they go back and forth about who is going to be the one that inherits the promise. And so what we have is Jacob and Esau. Esau surrenders his birthright for a bowl of stew. The story is there. There's fighting and whatnot, and they go off. So now we've got Abraham, and then not Ishmael, but Isaac. And then not Esau, but Jacob, because uh, Esau branches off and has uh, a nation called Edom, the Edomites, and you'll read about them as you're reading through the Old Testament. So if this is for the 100% promise of, of the descendants of Abraham, how are we losing descendants of Abraham from Israel? You guys heard of the Samaritans? Probably heard of the Good Samaritan, uh, that, that story uh, of, that Jesus told about who is my neighbor. Jews hated the Samaritans. God's people, Israel, hated the Samaritans. Why did they hate the Samaritans? Well, because the Samaritans were Jewish. But that branch of the family married into some other surrounding nations and, and mixed up some of their theology and... Very, very close, but had a difference in what the location of worship should be, and oh boy, did they ever go at it. They were identifiably Jewish. If you looked at their DNA, they would have Jewish DNA. Ethnically and spiritually, they're Jewish, but they had intermarried and were not of a pure bloodline. They weren't of the right theology. So they would say, God's people Israel, not Ishmaelites, not Edomites, not Samaritans. But all of these are descendants of Abraham. As we go through reading the, this chunk of Romans, as, as Paul's talking to the Romans and saying, these Roman Gentile Christians, he's talking and saying, God has not cut off Israel. We're seeing that it's not about biology. It's not about the descent from Abraham, because we've already gone through that. And it's, it's not about faith, because we know that Jesus has said their faith has gotten all messed up and upside down and backwards. In fact, God's people, Israel, come to the cross, come to the Messiah that they have been waiting for, that has been sent by God, the Son of God, come down from heaven, died on a cross, and they said, what do we do with this? What does God's people, Israel, do with his Messiah? Now, there are prominent teachers of, of the gospel 
that say, actually, Jesus is the Messiah for the Gentiles. The Jewish people are still waiting for their Messiah because they are. And if you look through all of these prophecies, if they have not been fulfilled in Jesus, then they don't apply to us. We shouldn't be singing about them. And they're still waiting. So what did these Jewish people do with Jesus? What did you know, Paul do with Jesus? What did Peter and James and John do with Jesus? What did Caiaphas do with Jesus? The religious leaders, the scribes, the teachers of the law, the Pharisees who were devoted to being God's chosen people. I'm not talking about replacement theology. I'm not talking about God cut off Israel and then replaced it with the church because that is something you only get to if you think back from here and get really confused and forget about history and forget about the fact that all, every single one of the first Christians was Jewish. And the only way we get to this being Israel is if we say God cut off from his chosen people every single person who put their faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah he sent. Every person that married a Gentile. Every person that accepted Jesus' atoning death on the cross, not part of God's chosen people anymore. God's people, Israel, get to wait over here. The church is something entirely different. But Paul draws a distinction in Romans between Israel and those who are descended from Israel. Israel, to Paul, is different than the ones who can trace their lineage back through Jacob. So he says that the unbelieving root has been cut off. If the unbelieving branch has been cut off, and in their place, we have been grafted in. And that's the celebration. That's the celebration right there, that we are not second-class citizens of the kingdom of heaven. But we are becoming part of the family of God that has been from Abraham all the way through, that God did not deny and denounce and cut off everyone of his chosen people, the Jews, who believed in Jesus. Because that was the argument that Paul was addressing there. That was the argument, that replacement, that the Romans were saying, no, the Jews messed it up. They're done. Forget about them. This is for us. And Paul said, no, look at me. I'm a Jew and a Christian. I am still part of God's people. And beyond that, they have not blown their chances. That's the argument that's going on in Romans 11. The Jewish people, Israel, the Israelites, those descended from Jacob, have not blown their chances. This was not their last chance. They can still be grafted back in. That's the phrase he uses, grafted back in, meaning they are apart from the people of Israel. They can be grafted back in. They haven't lost their chance. And God is so, so happy when they are, because they are the first fruits. They are the ones that God has called from the beginning and longs for. And his heart breaks. So what I'm saying is when you read through these prophecies, when you see something about Israel, and you hear on the news something about Israel, these are not necessarily the same thing. Now, you can argue with me, you can, you can debate with me. There are brilliant, brilliant Christian pastors and scholars that have a different opinion on that. They follow a different branch, they have a different understanding of Romans 11. I think they're wrong, they think I'm wrong, and that's okay. But what I will say to you is you are not a second-class citizen of the kingdom. You are not biding your time waiting for God's real chosen people to catch up. You are fully fledged, card carrying members of the kingdom of God, grafted into, the, into Israel, supported by the root that has gone back 
millennia. You are not part of a new thing, you're part of an ancient thing, and you're fully part of that thing. God's promises include you. You're not a bystander in all of this. So when it talks about, you know, the spirit breathing life into dry bones, that's us. God's people standing as an army full of power. Or we're waiting on the sidelines for that to happen still. The Holy Spirit has nothing to do with that. That's the choice that we're looking at. So what's your hope? Is your hope that someday, you know, if we support Israel, if we send them enough weapons, if we protect them from the nations around them, eventually they'll take over enough of this land that Jesus can come back? Because that is a legitimate interpretation that is being pushed in a lot of avenues. You want to go look it up on YouTube? All sorts of YouTube shows that'll tell you that. Or is your hope in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the comforter that he sent to walk with us, to equip us? Because it's not just about what your hope is, it's about what your role is. Are you passive bystanders, just waiting for God to finally get around to doing what he said he would do thousands of years ago. And, and, and you know what? We're going to make some YouTube shows, and we're going to dig into this, and we're going to play prophetic madness because we really want for that waiting time to be over. <coughs> is that your role, to tell people what the waiting time is going on? Or when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. And he was talking to the Jewish people on the hill, the people of God, Israel, does that include you? My understanding is that I have a job to do. That I have been tasked by Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit to show people his way, to show people the way of the true kingdom of God, to be a disciple who makes disciples of Jesus Christ. His kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, and I get to be part of that. That's my role. Or am I not part of that? So when I say this is kind of dry, and this is kind of technical, and this is kind of confusing, maybe it's not just like what's going on in my head and how should I figure this out. This has practical impact and most of us have never thought it through. And you might have heard it on the radio or you might have seen it on, on 700 Club or you might have seen it on uh, some Christian broadcast network that says something different. You know what? Dig your way up that branching chart, find out where you lie. I'll be okay with it. but I'm saying it matters. What you believe about God matters, what you believe about Israel matters because it changes our mission. It changes our strength, it changes our power, it changes our hope. And you might never have thought about it, you might have dug right into it, and, and you might agree with me, you might not agree with me, but it changes how you approach everything down the line as you're studying scripture, as you're deciding what God has for you in your life. I hand that to you. Do with it what you will. But my prayer is that you will connect with a God that has amazing things with you, for you, that you will connect with a God who, who has his best all through the mission for you, that you are not a passive bystander in your faith, but you're part of, of the team that God has put together to bring his kingdom to earth as it is in heaven. That's, that's where I'm going to stop.